Hi, Mike Hayden here from 24 Hour Solar Power. Today we're going to be talking about Solar 101 for beginners. We're going to be running through the six major components for a standalone or off-grid solar system. What's required and what, I, what each item does. So let's get stuck in. We'll start with the roof. You know, one of the most important things is actually mounting your solar panels and how they're going to be mounted in situation. There's lots of different types of options of shingles and things like that. We're just going to cover the basics today. You're going to want some racking. Now, deciding on how to mount your solar panels. In an off-grid situation, the best angle for your solar panels is normally your latitude plus 12 and a half degrees. So you live on a latitude which is 28 degrees, and you add 12 degrees to that, you've got 40 degrees. You want to get your panels about 40 degrees. The reason for that is the flatter solar panels lay, the better they perform in summer, and the more of an angle they stand up, the better they perform in winter. It's all about angles with solar panel production. Now, when the grid's available, most people just put it whatever angle the roof is. It's the simplest, easiest, really not worth the extra getting the right angle. In an off-grid situation, though, you really want to make sure you've got a really good angle for winter or when your highest energy demand is. Winter, normally, you know, we've got long nights, short days, and we really want the most amount of production out of our solar panels as possible. So you've got the option of mounting flat to roof. If you do have a flat to roof, you can get these tripod, solar tripods they're called, to mount your panels on the right angles. These can be adjustable over the seasons. It's pretty much not really worth it and the amount of energy and effort it takes to actually get up and adjust them. If you really want the ability to adjust your solar panels and make things easier over time, you're best getting one of these post mount or a ground mount solar system. The post mounts are adjustable so you can actually adjust it with the seasons. Makes your life easy to clean your panels and things like that. So with panels, there's different types of panels and there's loads of different panels on the market. I'll pretty much explain the easiest way to remember it is the blue panels are poly panels and poly panels were designed and they really perform better in cooler climates. Mono panels are more of the black panels and they do perform better in hotter and they handle the heat better than a poly panel. It all really depends on your situation and budget, what's going to be the best solution for you. They also do make black poly panels these days, so it can be you know, a bit confusing, but the simplest way to remember, poly panels are better for cooler climates and mono panels are better for the hotter climates. The biggest value rate on solar panels is actually the little join on the front of them. Now, if you do live in an area where it gets hot and cold a lot, I'd probably be more looking at more of a mono type Panel, Sun Power is probably one of the best, best panels in the world with a full copper backing sheet on the back, which doesn't have the same failure point that traditional solar panels have. So there is just a lot, lots of different options there. Consider what's the best for your climate and your situation. Now moving on from our solar panels, the next thing I want is a solar charge controller. Now there's different types of solar charge controllers out there. So we've got our racking on the roof, we put our panels down, we run some cabling down to our solar charge controllers. Now, different types of solar charge controllers, the smaller systems, these PWMs, are lower cost. They're pulse width modulators is what they do. They pretty much turn your solar panels on and off. When your batteries are full, they turn off. When the batteries drop down a bit, they turn your solar panels back on. Pretty simple. That's why they're low cost. Now, for your solar panels, it's actually like taking off in third gear all the time in the morning. So it's a bit like, because when your battery voltages are low, the solar panel is a bit like rrr, 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 trying to get going and then as the day gets on your solar panels get going and they take off and you're in top gear and you're doing your thing. Now an MPPT is what's called a maximum power point tracker so it keeps your solar panels at the perfect charge voltage all day long. So it's like an automatic gearbox for your solar system. In bigger systems I'd highly recommend pretty much an MPPT I wouldn't ever recommend putting a PWM even smaller systems, you'll get a better result. You do get 20 to 30 percent more power out of your solar out of your solar panels by using an MPPT. So I'd highly recommend going down the path of putting an MPPT in. You've always got that automatic gearbox, changing gears to your solar panel and keeping it in the perfect gear all day long. Now the next thing, and this is probably going to be the biggest investment you do when it comes to your solar system, is batteries. And batteries are complicated. There's lots of different batteries for lots of different situations. 
and they all have their purpose and it all really comes down to you and your situation and what you want to achieve. Now let us that are good for small RV type, motorhome, lights, TVs, fridges, really light loads. This is the way I like to think about lead acid batteries. You don't want to run anything on them that's going to heat or cool fast. So any high current drawers, they can handle high current drawers really well. But over time, you'll be buying new batteries faster when you run heavy loads on lead acid batteries. That's what they're designed for. Older, lead, this is very typical, lead acid batteries, were they, well, they still are the number one selling battery in the world because they're used in every single car that goes on the road. Even electric cars that go in these days, they still have a 12 volt lead acid battery in them. Now there's different types of lead acid batteries. Sealed and wet is probably the easiest way to understand them. The two different types mainly. Wet batteries, you can get away and give them a lot more of a hard time. You do require to maintain them and fill them up. A lot of people get like old secondhand forklift batteries and stuff like that. The reality is most of the time they fail within a couple of years. So if you just want something to get you through a couple of years, hey, that's great. They are going to require maintenance and topping up all the time. Nickel is another really good battery that's used in an off-grid situation. And these are, you know, they have a history of lasting over 100 years and still working. Now with nickel iron batteries, they're a real storage battery, not a power battery. So if you think about your old drills, you know, the, when you're drilling something and they start to slow down and go, roo, 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 roo. That's a real typical behavior of a nickel iron battery that early in the morning or when they're low, they'll run lights and TVs, but they won't run a heavy load. So they're really good for lights, TVs, fridges, just nice, light, consistent loads. They do not like heavy loads. So when you turn a big load on, they have a voltage swing, they'll fall through the floor and you'll have a mini blackout. You're not going to harm the batteries. They're a really hardy, harsh battery that can take a lot of punishment and they have a really longevity. Now we'll talk about lithium batteries. Lithium batteries are a great battery solution for an off-grid. Now Tesla, you can't use in an off-grid situation. Your warranty will be void. I'm just using this example here because it's one of the most popular batteries. Tesla use a chemistry called NMC, which is nickel, manganese, cobalt. Now that's the most energy dense lithium battery available at the market at the moment. So basically in a smaller space, you get more usable capacity. In an off-grid situation, space is very rarely an issue. So NMC batteries are really good for like caravans, motorhomes, and in a grid connected situation where space is limited and they want as much usable capacity in a smaller space. The most common lithium-based battery used off-grid is a, a, a LiPo4, basically, which is lithium ferrophate phosphate. It's probably the most safest lithium chemistries on the market. What's really good about these rack mount lithium phosphate batteries is you can actually continue to buy and add and grow your system over time with these ones that have the built-in battery management systems. Now, BMS is what you'll see a lot of those. You have batteries with communications, without communications. We'll just keep it simple today. Just with the lithium, what's really good about them, you can buy another one add in the future. So at the end of your life, you expect to end your warranty period at 10 years, say with these here. If you're down capacity, you just buy another one and put another one in you, there you've got your capacity back. Well, with the lead acid type batteries, you're removing them, sending them to the scrapyard and getting new batteries. Another popular battery these days in off-grid situations, these LTOs, are lithium titanate oxide. Now these come with a 20 year warranty and have a really long life expectancy. They reckon that these batteries will last up to 60 years with the cycle of life. So that's a really good longevity from a sustainable point of view. They tick the boxes and they're great from the point of view. They're just like the lithium batteries. You can continue buying sticks and adding the sticks and growing over time. And like I said, this is probably one of the most important decisions to make is what batteries you're gonna use because it's so important you get the right batteries to compensate for what you want to do over time. If you want to grow your system, or you want the ability to grow your system, and yeah, always remember, add more battery storage up front because it is actually one of the most expensive things to add in the future. But if you do go down with a lithium-based type battery, you can just continue to grow and add it in the future. Now, the next major component you're going to want in your system is an inverter. Now, what an inverter does, it takes the DC, so direct current from your batteries, and turns it into AC, which is alternating current, which most of our appliances run from in our houses. Now, the cheapest and easiest way to do it is actually buy an inverter, and then a battery charger separate. The inverter will literally just take the DC and turn it into AC, so take your DC to, you know, find 10 or 240 usable power. 
and the battery is charged as designed that in when it's bad weather and things like that, you can start your backup source and charge your batteries and in more of a controlled situation. Now we highly recommend that in bigger situations, pretty much most, and when I say a bigger situation, if you plan to run anything 240, a household fridge, you know, some computers, lights and things like that, it's very likely you're better off going down the path of using an inverter charger, which is like this electronics here of this Victron inverter charger. There's lots of different products and brands out in the market here. What's the main benefit of an inverter charger is when you do turn your backup source on like a generator, the inverter charger says, hey, I'm gonna give the house power, whatever you're running right now, priority, you get that power first, then any excess goes to the batteries. Where with you've got an inverter and a separate battery charger, it can't work that out and you'll have a situation where if you're running a big load from batteries and your battery charger is charging flat out, you can overload your generator. With some education, you can get around that and keep it quite simple. It's all gonna come down to budget and what do you want? Do you want things just to work or do you wanna be out switching things on and off all the time to make things do stuff? The other thing you're gonna hear about is in an off-grid situation is AC coupled or grid tight inverters. Now how these work, they only work on a day when the sun's shining. So if you've got an off-grid inverter here, now an off-grid inverter, a 5 kVA off-grid inverter or 5,000 watt inverter is only gonna give you 5,000 watts of usable power at any one time. So at night, you've got the ability with a 5,000 watt off-grid inverter to turn on 5,000 watts of appliances at any one time. Also remember there's losses and heat and stuff like that. If you do really want to run a consistent load of 5,000 watts, I'd be really considering putting in an 8,000 watt inverter. Don't push things to the limits in off-grid because when things get hot, they overload, they turn off, and then you've got to black out. So that's what an off-grid inverter is. If it's a 5 kVA inverter or 5,000 watt, you can pull 5,000 watts. So say for example, you can turn your toaster, your kettle, and your microwave all on at once, and you can run those three things at once. And then if you do go and turn your electric cooktop on, you're gonna have a blackout. Now with these AC coupled or grid tight inverters, if the sun's shining another day and your batteries are full, you can pull 5,000 watts from this one. And let's just say you get a 5,000 watt one here and the sun's shining perfect. Of a day, you can comfortably turn on about 8,000 watts of loads of a day and run 8,000 watts of a day. But overnight, when the panels go down or the sun doesn't shine, this inverter doesn't work and you're back to only having 5,000 watts. What's really good about these grid connected or AC coupled inverters in off-grid situation, you've only got about 5% losses from panels to power points. So if you do a lot of energy use of a day, which is highly recommended in off-grid, do as much as you can of a day, it's gonna save your investment on batteries you've only got 5% losses from panels to power points of a day, where with an off-grid inverter, the reality is on a good day, you might have about 20% losses from panels into your solar charge controller, into batteries, back out into the inverter charger, into your power points. You're gonna lose 20 to 30% of that usable capacity on a daily basis. So something to remember about losses, something a lot of people forget about when designing systems, remember your losses. So yeah, that's what AC couple inverter is good for. Most of these systems, pretty much when we're putting, when we're designing and installing for a customer, we use inverter, we use these AC coupled. We're pretty much, if it's a three kVA inverter or bigger, we try and slip one of these in here. It just gives people a better experience in off-grid, more usable power. And say, for example, you're running around an air con of a day, these are great for that there. Now, the last major component you want to consider for your off-grid solar system is your backup source, your generator. There's lots of different types of generators different fuel sources, diesel, petrol, auto start, not. The way I like to think about it, the prettiest, prettiest way to think about and understand, simplest way, is you want a generator big enough to run the load you're gonna run when you're charging your battery. So if it's raining, it's pouring outside, or it's snowing, whatever situation you're in, you've got no sun charging your batteries, you want a generator that can run your house loads because the house loads will always get the priority of the usage, and then you want it big enough to charge your batteries flat out. So say for example, you use one kilowatt of energy an hour and your battery charger can charge at 3000 watts an hour, that's 4000 watts. I'd highly recommend getting a generator that's a six or seven or eight kVA generator, whatever you can fit in your budget, that literally it can charge your batteries flat out, run your house load, because the longer your generator runs, the more petrol it uses, the noise it gets and more losses. 
and just the more cost it's going to be to you over time. If you can have your generator, I like to normally design systems that within about two to three hours the batteries are full. It's pretty simple. Auto start or not, it's really up to you whether you want a system with an auto start. They're pretty simple, the auto starts. They'll just turn on when your batteries are flat or if you put a load big enough that's too big for the, your inverter, it'll start up and things like that. Just some things to consider with generators is the noise, the maintenance, and is there a service agent in your area? A lot of people try and buy generators online to try and save money, and when something does go wrong, there's no one in the area to service it, you gotta send it back and just cost an absolute fortune. So just something to consider. For a more in-depth overview of off-grid living and designing a solar system, check out this video here. See you in the next one.